I feel like nothing's being done. And I hate to say that. I'm sure that, you know, there's people who are probably going to argue with that, but there's nothing being done. And as a result, the homelessness keeps growing. A sense of hopelessness among some. I'm constantly looking for what are good solutions to support. And meanwhile, just trying person to person to do what I can. A sense of duty among others, all hoping to find a way to help 30,000 people in the Bay Area who are living on the streets. I don't want to be homeless or I don't want to be somebody that actually doesn't, you know, just fit in with mainstream society. City leaders trying to find a solution. Public works cleaning encampments that stretch entire city blocks. They hope that if they take everything we own, we'll leave. Well, the majority of us, we've got nowhere else to go. Or, or like myself, Oakland is my home. I've been here for 35 years. The issue affecting all walks of life. We're definitely seeing more families. We're seeing more um, families with young children, which is really tragic, but not just for the health issues that surround that, but also for education issues. Not only a humanitarian crisis, but a health concern. They don't have uh, bathrooms. They don't, you know, they poop, they pee, you know, right outside their tent. I, I keep a bucket with maybe some bleach in it and um, a septic cleaner. I don't know if, if that works, but I figure the clean septic tank so it has it has a work. So, you know, I may pour a bottle of uh, a Febreze in it. One of many issues, the lack of affordable housing, forcing people to leave the Bay Area or else lose their home and move onto the streets. I think it's so unfair. There are so many families out there that are going through homelessness, that are spending, you know, 50 to 60 to even up to 75% of their income on rent. I originally lived in the city of Mountain View, and then um, I got priced out from there, and I moved to the city of Santa Clara, got priced out from there, moved to the city of Sunnyvale, got priced out from there. Tonight, we search for a solution. And thank you so much for joining us for this live KTVU event. I'm Frank Somerville. And I'm Julie Hayner. Tonight we are bringing you part two of our special on homelessness in the Bay Area. Over the next hour, we will be discussing the search for a solution. We've been stressing that this is a Bay Area-wide problem. We're all affected by it one way or another. And tonight we're going to learn what you can do to help all of those who are living out on the streets. In about 10 minutes, the mayors of Oakland, San Jose, and Berkeley, along with the head of the Department of Homelessness in San Francisco, will Will join us to have an open, honest discussion about this complex issue. First, though, here's a look at what's already being done in the Bay Area to help support the homeless. Excuse me, sir. You're taking care of yourself, okay? I'm homeless. The work to end homelessness begins on the streets. Street outreach teams from cities and counties, along with members of nonprofit organizations, meet face to face with homeless across the Bay Area. The goal, to help them get into housing. And a majority of the people on the streets want exactly that. In a year, I pray that I'm not here. During the most recent homeless count in Alameda County, only 2% of people responding said they were not interested in affordable housing. There are dozens of shelters available for the homeless around the Bay Area. San Francisco alone has specific shelters for families, women, and children. However, there are more than 1,100 people on the city's single adult shelter wait list hoping for a temporary bed. I think that as of right now, the average time that people are searching for housing can be from up to six months up to like five years. Cities also dealing with encampments that stretch along multiple city blocks. I mean, the city comes by every two weeks, picks up their garbage for them. I have to pay $700 a month for my little bin over here, but they get it for free. While funding is always an issue, there is a significant amount of money spent on homelessness. San Francisco is planning on spending $305 million this year to help the homeless. With that type of money being spent on the problem, many people are wondering why homeless encampments still line the streets. In Oakland, homeless encampment complaints rose 600% from 2011 to 2016. In March, city officials took action, adding safety rails to prevent the trash from spilling out into the streets, along with portable toilets and a wash station. People start to realize that the city is starting to help us. I'm for the city. I think the city of Oakland is amazing and very generous. 
Navigation centers also help the homeless take action. In San Francisco, five centers are currently open within the city, with another set to open late this year. They offer a variety of services. Medication management, uh, psychiatric support, addiction support, um, and it will be a day treatment program along with overnight stays. It's part of a major struggle financially, getting mental health services for those who need them. In San Jose, police officers take crisis intervention training, but say more needs to be done. It's important for us to realize that the very first person and the last person you're gonna be calling is the police when it comes to a mentally ill type of situation, and it shouldn't be that way. There should have been the front end work. There should have been care. These are all pieces of the same puzzle. Figuring out how to help the homeless get off the streets of the Bay Area and into permanent housing. San Francisco is working to find solutions through technology. The online navigation and entry system known as One System was launched in May by the city's Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing. It's a coordinated entry program that will house a person's information, including their medical history and the kinds of services they've sought in the past. The goal is to streamline information to serve clients more efficiently and avoid having them retell their story about how they became homeless to every agency they visit. We're re-traumatizing people by asking them to tell us their story um, over and over when they've just told provider A and now they're at provider D and telling the exact same information. Before the launch of One System, the city was using 15 different databases and the information wasn't being shared. The new system is expected to be fully up and running by next summer. City officials say when it comes to privacy concerns, the database is protected and complies with HIPAA regulations. Not every solution is welcome with open arms. Right now, a controversial bill to allow safe drug injection sites in California is making its way through the state capitol. The sites would give people on the street battling addiction, a place to safely inject illegal drugs. The bill has already cleared the state assembly, but now it has to get through the state Senate. Eight counties, including San Francisco, Alameda, and Santa Cruz, are trying to create safe injection sites and are hoping that this bill becomes law. But there is stiff opposition from groups, including the California State Sheriff's Association and the Police Chiefs Association. They worry that these injection sites will increase crime in those particular neighborhoods. San Francisco Supervisor London Breed is leading the push for safe injection sites in San Francisco. I get email complaints from my constituents on a regular basis about needles found not just in major uh, corridors, major commercial corridors, but in neighborhoods and places where you think you wouldn't. In the city, a 15-member task force, including homeless advocates, is now looking into the idea of safe injection sites. Many homeless advocates say the number one solution in helping the homeless is housing. But the problem is made even more challenging when you factor in California's housing crisis. Construction simply doesn't keep up with demand. And that's also true when it comes to affordable housing. KTVU's Tom Vekar looked at some unconventional ways that housing is being matched up with those people who are looking for a place to live. Most older American homes were built to house multiple child families, homes that were often passed down through the generations. But as America prospered, many Americans decided that living with mom and dad was not the thing to do. So the American dream of home ownership evolved into a home of your own. Many people equated that with success. The bigger the home, the better, regardless of family size. As owners age, many remain in their often overlarge homes for a multitude of reasons, including simply wanting to stay in it, to fear of moving, to lack of better, smaller, affordable housing. Yeah, Stephen Marshall is founder of Petaluma-based A Little Home on the Trailer, a company dedicated to putting small homes on the existing properties of larger homes. Freeing up that big house, that three bedroom, two bath house that grandma lives in alone, freeing that up for her children or renters or whoever that might be and then grandma moves into the hundred thousand dollar home while the million dollar home is made available to fill up with a full family. This is allowed by many laws provided that family or caretakers provide senior care and health care to the aging owners. It's called infill or densifying. 
There's already a house, there's already the land, there's already all the utilities. It's the same concept as allowing mother-in-law or second family units. In fact, there are numerous affordable home concepts that could help solve California's housing crisis. The housing market and the production of housing is regulated in a way that no other product that we, that we create as an economy is regulated. Mike Reagan is the senior vice president for policy at the Bay Area Council, a consortium of some of the Bay Area's biggest employers. He says alternative affordable housing can only happen if communities will consider and permit some of them. People believe that affordable housing, for instance, negatively impacts uh, the value of their home. That's, that's patently false. Um, we know that building affordable housing in communities has no negative impact on home values. The internet is full of examples. Modular factory-built homes are far cheaper. Many experts say they're at least as good or better than lot-built homes. So-called tiny homes, homes made with very small square footage, often factory-built, are far cheaper than traditional family-sized homes. Container homes, converted new or used strong steel sea containers, present another low-cost option for smaller, stackable, affordable home communities. Shopping mall conversions, though few and far between now, are becoming more and more desirable because the basic building as well as the needed infrastructure already in place. One of the nation's first shopping malls, the stately Galleria style Providence Place in Rhode Island, has been successfully converted into 48 225 foot square foot micro homes while retaining some of the lower level shops and cafes. Warehouse conversions, if done to safety codes, could provide many multi family units. Though a somewhat radical idea, floating homes can present another low-cost alternative when done on large barges. Such facilities are already used to house oil and maritime workers in remote locations, housing more than 300 workers. The Marquette, a planned luxury traveling river condo complex, will have dozens and dozens of condos that start at just $300,000. Even more radical. There are many unused underground facilities that could be converted to subterranean living. In the always hot Australian outback mining town of Coober Pedy, most residents and hotel guests live underground. In Las Vegas, as many as a thousand homeless folks have chosen to live in floodwater tunnels, weather allowing. Within the state, there are many unused underground spaces, especially in urban areas. On a societal level, uh, things have to be a little bit more mainstream. Homeowners need to understand that unless we create a sustainable supply of affordable housing, not just uh, below market rate subsidized housing, but workforce housing, um, those short-term gains that we're all enjoying in our property values are going to crater. All of these concepts will have serious to dead on arrival public and governmental opposition. Tom Vacar, KTVU Fox 2 News. Well, some people have proposed the idea of building tiny homes, as Tan just mentioned, as a way to help house the homeless, but that idea is already facing opposition. Just recently, the city of San Jose was forced to scale back plans to put tiny homes for the homeless on 99 sites around the city. The move comes after complaints from people in some neighborhoods where the tiny homes were going to be installed. City leaders have now agreed to move forward with a pilot program that would involve no more than three sites, but the sites would be considered small villages which could house up to 25 people. There's no reason to fear these people and we need to find more reasons to house them. We need to find more ways to house them. And tiny homes are just another piece of the puzzle. There are still a lot of questions, including who will live in these homes and what types of services will be provided. City housing officials say they'll come back in about a month with a plan and a timeline for moving forward. So we've taken a look at what's being done to help the homeless, but there's so much more to it. Coming up after the break, we'll sit down with the mayors from around the Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, also the head of the Department of Homelessness in San Francisco for an extended commercial free conversation to break down the issue and discuss possible solutions. We'll be streaming the conversation live on Facebook with a member of San Francisco's Department of Homelessness on hand to answer your questions. You can also tweet us using the hashtag KTVU if you have questions for our city leaders. That's all coming up as our live special on Bay Area Homeless, searching for a solution continues.
Tonight we have the rare opportunity to sit down with several leaders from around the Bay Area to talk about homelessness. Yeah, the goal here is to have an open, honest discussion about homelessness and what's being done now and also what can be done in the future to get the thousands of people who are homeless off the streets. And joining us tonight are the mayors of several local cities and we'd like to introduce you to them right now. With us tonight, San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo and Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff. San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee couldn't be here tonight, so sitting in his place is Jeff Kaczynski. He's the head of the Department of Homelessness in San Francisco. Also joining us tonight is Berkeley Mayor Jesse Aragain. So thank you all for joining us. Before we get started here, we just want to ask a simple question. Is this a crisis or is this a concern? Mayor, I'll start with you. Crisis. It's a crisis. It's a crisis. It's a crisis that's been going on for over 30 years now. Okay, so we all agree, crisis. We also asked our viewers the same question. We want to show you the results of that. More than 2,000 people voted in our poll. 66% feel homelessness is a crisis. 24% feel it's only a concern. So again, let's go around the table. Obviously, homelessness is a complex issue. What do you feel is the number one priority when it comes to tackling this problem? And again, we'll start with you, Mayor. Well, number one is we are in a cost of living crisis in general in the Bay Area, and that starts with housing. So the cost and availability of affordable housing. Uh, but I mean, when you look more holistically, there's not just one thing. When you look at the percentages of our homeless population that are battling uh, physical disabilities, uh, chronic health issues, mental disabilities, addictions, this is obviously part of the complex nature of this. We um, have to deal with the current situation and address the health and hygiene concerns of our unsheltered residents as well as those who are around them. But we also have got to invest in the long-term solutions to make the Bay Area affordable for everyone. Mayor, I saw you nodding your approval to what yeah. she was saying. What are your thoughts? Well, there are a lot of simplistic solutions that get floated out there. Uh, but when you look at them more closely and you try to implement them, they're neither simple nor solutions. And I think we we'll ultimately all agree that the only real solution is permanent supportive housing for the thousands of homeless that we have in our cities. Uh, and that is a very expensive proposition. The alternative, though, is much more costly uh, because we're all spinning our wheels uh, managing homelessness. And we know it would be much more cost effective in the long run if we were to get people housed. But where does that money come from? You're right, it is very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. Where does that money come from? Well, in our city, we launched an inclusionary housing program that within a couple of years should generate about $20 million annually. Uh, we also have an impact fee program on market rate housing. And uh, last year, our voters countywide approved a bond, an uh, almost billion dollar bond, about 700 million of that will focus on affordable housing for the homeless. And so there are sources of funding. Uh, the challenge is it's not just dollars, it's about finding sites, and that takes real political will. Uh, because as you can imagine, there are plenty of neighbors who would say they'd rather not have it in their neighborhood. All right, well, let's go over to Berkeley. When it comes to your city, what do you see as a number one priority in tackling this really difficult issue? Well, similar to what the other mayor said, housing. Housing first is the solution to ending homelessness. And study after study shows that if you can get somebody in a unit of housing and provide supportive services, it goes a long way to make sure that person stays housed and stays off the street. Now, the challenge that we face, and as was mentioned by Mayor Schaff and Mayor Ricardo, is we don't have enough housing, uh, permanently affordable housing for the thousands of people, not just on Berkeley streets, but on Oakland streets and throughout the Bay Area. And so we need the assistance of state and federal leaders to provide local governments more resources. Oakland passed an infrastructure bond. We passed a housing bond in Alameda County. So there's more local resources for us to, to construct affordable housing. But we're, it's going to take uh, the work of leaders on many levels to address this crisis. And what do we do about those people that, that can't get connected to housing, the people that are long-term chronically homeless? who can't access our shelters, who are living in encampments, how do we serve their needs as well? Complex, okay, San Francisco. Well, I hate to sound like a broken record, but housing <laughs> is the solution to homelessness. I mean, there are, it is a complex problem. There's issues around mental health issues, addiction disorders, unemployment, underemployment. However, none of those get addressed while you're living on the streets. People need to have a permanent place to live, and we need to find ways, both as, as local governments, but also our state and our country, really need to step up and address this housing crisis, because that's the only way we're going to end homelessness uh, here and around the country. 
But, Jeff, it's going to take years to build the number of houses that we need to support all of these homeless. In the meantime, we have these encampments. And, and I mean, anywhere you drive, in Oakland, in San Francisco, in Berkeley, in San Jose, you see these encampments everywhere. And it's almost this cat and mouse game where the Department of Public Works will come out, will clean up the encampment, it'll be clean for a little while, and then, and then you just watch it happen. In a couple of days, they start moving back. And it, what do you do so that you don't just keep pushing the problem around? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, Merrily, a few years ago, opened up San Francisco's first navigation center in an effort to uh, address this problem, creating uh, low barrier to entry shelters that people feel comfortable coming into. Uh, they can come, come and go as they please 24-7. And we've opened up five, five of those in the past few years in order to provide people in encampments a safe place to go where their service is on site, and then where we can help navigate them to either other shelter programs or uh, hopefully into permanent supportive housing. But if I could just just say, I'm not trying to, to, to challenge you here, just playing the devil's advocate. If you've opened up all of those things, why are we still seeing so many homeless people on the streets and why are we seeing these homeless encampments everywhere? Because this problem has been growing since 1978 when HUD began major cuts and we've seen an 80 percent cut in federal spending on affordable housing. The problem is not just going to go away overnight. However, in San Francisco we have uh, worked in 18 different encampments during the past year. We've offered safe places of shelter to about 600 people. 75 percent of those have accepted those offer of shelter and just because there's still encampments on the street, Street doesn't mean that we haven't done good work in the areas where we've been successful. We've learned a lot. We just need to keep doing more and to keep scaling up what we know works. And Mayor Schaff, you said a minute ago that your city is going to try these navigation centers. Tell us about that. Well, we have had something called the Henry Robinson House. It's been very successful. 80% uh, of the people that leave Henry Robinson exit into permanent housing. And as we've checked back on them a year later, we've only had a 2% return to homelessness. So we know that this works, but it only serves 300 people a year. And so what we're doing in the immediate term, while we look for a second building that we can run as a Henry Robinson, we are looking to experiment with what we are calling outdoor navigation centers. These are not sanctioned encampments. Uh, they will be outdoors. They will have like tough shed structures in them, not tents. Uh, they will have 24-7 security and controlled access, and we will not allow them to be more than, say, 50 people. But we are working to put these up right away. In fact, uh, the city council meeting, uh, the first one in October, will seek approval of three potential sites so that we can start having a place while our shelters and our navigation center type building is full, at least we can have a place to move people Where to. Where would one of those potential sites be? Do you have anything identified? Um, the three sites, and these are already uh, in the council, there's one that is on MLK, there is one at East 12th and 23rd Avenue, and then there is one right near the um, encampment that you visited, mm -hmm. Frank. It is privately owned, but we're seeking the um, permission to negotiate to try and lease that site. And again, as you all said, I mean, the good news is our voters approved a bond, and that does give us resources to work with. How much with. would something like that cost, one potential site? Uh, it depends on whether we own it or not, but to operate it, we've budgeted it about half a million dollars a year. So this kind of piggybacks off of uh, when I was talking with a couple of homeless people the other day, uh, the, the, the guy was saying, the city has all these vacant lots, why can't we just go there? So let's play what what he said, and then and then Mayor. Just again, we don't own that lot. Oh, there right. are a lot of people. We don't own that lot. But yes. we generally don't own them. Yeah, but let's hear <laughs> let's hear what he had to okay. say. All you have to do is give give us a, a big big property with a fence around it. Uh, we'll, we'll tarp off the fence. We'll put campsites in there. We'll police it ourselves, give us a couple of dumpsters, give us some porta potties. You got the trash problem dealt with, you got the human waste problem dealt with, you'll have the, the syringe, the syringe, syringe and uh, toxic waste problem dealt with, because we'll have the dispensers throughout the camp, and we'll police ourselves. So, Mayor, there is an empty lot right next to him, but you were saying that that is not owned by the city, but you are going to bring some porta potties. Uh, and a dumpster to that area, correct? Uh, porta potties and individual trash cans mm -hmm. that will be serviced actually should be arriving at that particular encampment on Tuesday. But that lot that he is talking yeah. about is the one that is privately owned that we would seek yeah. permission to negotiate to lease. Mayor, what do you think about that? Uh, basically saying that 
there are these empty lots, maybe empty houses. Why couldn't we go live there? Why couldn't we have a dumpster? Why couldn't we uh, have porta potties? And we'll support ourselves. Well, we've been providing, for example, mobile hygiene units uh, throughout the city for the last year or so, and that's been a, a successful way of enabling folks to get showers, to get laundry done, and so forth, uh, so that they have a shot at being able to get into a, uh, a prospective employer and get a job. At least they'll be able to have a real chance at it. Uh, you know, we have a lot of empty lots that are privately owned. Mm -hmm. uh, and that costs real dollars in order to lease or to purchase those lots. And we're certainly open to it, but we think the best alternative is to start with the publicly owned lots. And that means Caltrans, it means our local transit agencies, it means county, city, everybody working together to find the best sites because those are the sites you can get on right away without engaging in link the negotiations and without spending a lot of money. And I want to quickly follow up. Your city has proposed the tiny homes concept. Yeah. Where do things stand right now on that? Yeah, what we're trying to do is to find a way to get past the challenge that Frank identified, which is it's very expensive and very time consuming to build a lot of permanent housing. We'd love to be able to do it, but it can't be done easily. And so uh, we got a, a special bill through the legislature to enable us to bypass the building code essentially to be able to build more quickly. This tiny home concept has emerged. Uh, we've got an architect, Gensler, that's doing this pro bono to help us build these units. Now the challenge is finding sites. And we've got a lot of folks who say we don't want it in the, our neighborhoods. It seems like and that's the big the big challenge. Is is, everyone says they want to have a solution, yeah. yep. but no one wants that solution in their backyard. It, it doesn't matter what the solution looks like. The fundamental issue is it has to be built in a real place in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means you have you, know, you need political will. You need to be able to tell people, look, it's not a question of whether or not the homeless are going to live in your neighborhood. They already live in our neighborhoods. They're in our parks and in our streets. The question is, how are they going to live? And then how would you identify who gets to live where? There's a public process. That's the way it works in cities, right? We have a lot of community meetings. Uh, not everybody uh, feels great about the outcome, uh, but it's a democratic process, and then we vote in public. Uh, and these are tough decisions I think we all need to make as, as elected leaders. Mayor, why is it that, that when we see homelessness, we see it in San Francisco, we see it in Oakland, we see it in San Jose, we see it in Berkeley, why is it that we don't see it in Walnut Creek or Danville or Lafayette or Orinda? Well, I, I can assume that um, the fact that our cities have such robust services, um, shelter and social services for the homeless, as well as just the environment, the climate, when it was a city that is an inviting and welcoming to people. Berkeley's had a long history of having a transient population, so um, it's not a surprise that uh, we have a large number of homeless people, but it really is a regional problem. Um, in Albany, when they cleared the Albany Bolt, which mm -hmm. was a, a, a park. Right up by um, Golden Gate Fields. Right near Golden Gate Fields, um, we saw a significant increase in homelessness in West Berkeley. And that's where the encampment under the uh, freeway at Gilman, um, exactly. that's how that I've started. Gone by that a number of times, and yeah. West Berkeley, mm -hmm. um, usually it's Telegraph and downtown where we see large numbers of homeless people. West Berkeley has uh, a growing number of encampments, and that's an outgrowth of the decision that Albany made to move the homeless encampment on the bulb. And so the decisions that cities make, um, and that's why coordination is so essential, um, does have an impact on Berkeley or San Francisco or Oakland. And, uh, that, that's what I was wondering, because as the mayor of Berkeley, wouldn't you be upset with Albany? I know there were a lot of people who live in Berkeley <laughs> yes. who were very upset. We, we were upset with Albany, and uh, we have a major project, uh, a 200-unit uh, supportive housing project that we are uh, going to be constructing in downtown Berkeley. We've asked the city of Albany to provide some financial assistance to, to help make that project happen. Uh, since we will be serving their population. It's a population that is not unique to Berkeley. It, it, it spreads across borders. This is a regional population. It is a regional problem. You touched on the culture here. Do you think the culture in the Bay Area, since it's kind of known as a bleeding heart, it, people are very generous here, they want to help people, do you think that that is contributing to the problem or do you think it doesn't make a difference? And let's ask what you think in San Francisco. I'm not sure if, it, if it's contributing to the problem. What I do know is we have a very robust economy uh, in the Bay Area and people from around the country from various walks of life come here looking for opportunities and when individuals end up uh, or families end up on the streets it's our responsibility to do our best to try to get them uh, back on the road to self-sufficiency and, and into housing. But I want to give you Oakland statistics. Uh, when we did our time and point count this year 
86% of the homeless had lived, last lived yes. and been housed in Alameda County. Yeah, yeah. And that's and happening in other places yeah, too. And yes. of them, more than 60% had been in this area for more than 10 years. These are our neighbors. Okay, These so are what's not happening? transient people. The, the cost of housing has gone up 25% in the last two years and income has only gone up 5%. And would you contribute that to part of the tech boom? As we see these tech companies coming in, they're doing a lot for the local economy, Oops. but they're also bringing in higher paid workers and those lower income people are being pushed out? Absolutely, and this is a regional problem. And Sam and I um, both sit on MTC and talk about this a lot. But in the last, you know, more than a decade, we've grown the economy without growing the housing stock. Mm -hmm. We've added eight new jobs for every one unit of housing that we've built, and that's not even counting affordable housing. Is there more that the high-tech community could do to help? Well, I think fundamentally, the first thing we need to do is look at ourselves, I think, within the government, because uh, the reality is there are some cities that are doing some great work out there, San Francisco and Oakland and others. Uh, but the reality is the great majority of our cities in, in this Bay Area, 99 of them, uh, are suburban. And they don't want to build housing in their borders. And we could radically change the scope of this problem if we had the right incentives in place to enable those smaller suburbs to actually build the housing to support all the jobs that they're willing to accept. We've got gigantic campuses in many of these smaller towns, and they don't want the housing with them because the financial incentives for cities are simply aligned to take the jobs, not the housing. Are there things that other cities are doing around the country that you've seen that's working that we aren't doing here? I think there's a lot of great experimentation that's happening right here. I mean, let's not forget the fact um, that this just happens to be, depending on which uh, survey you're looking at, the most expensive housing market in the nation. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot to do with the situation we're in. Uh, but, I, you know, what they're doing with navigation centers is tremendous. You know, we're converting motels into uh, apartments for the homeless. We've converted two this year, and that's been very successful. It's about half the cost of building new housing. Uh, we're we're going to see what happens with tiny homes and a lot of other innovations. Um, and we're going to keep learning from all these other cities. Uh, but what we are seeing is that the, the simple solutions just don't work. Mm -hmm. This is hard work. It takes real resources and real will. Have any of you thought of reaching out, like you mentioned, to a tech company, to the leaders of these big companies and saying, is there something you can do to help lessen the burden on us? Yes, well, we're doing okay. it now. Let's, so have you talked to one specifically you can name? Uh, sure. Uh, I know that the CEO of Cisco, for example, uh, uh, Chuck is deeply invested in addressing this problem and has been uh, working very hard with other executives to see how they can make a major uh, uh, push uh, financially to, to help. We've seen what Mark Zuckerberg's done with education. We've seen what Mark Benioff has done with Children's Hospital Oakland and all of the donations. And with that family homelessness. Yeah, yeah I think right. that uh, Mark and Lynn Benioff have invested a significant amount of money into addressing family homelessness in San Francisco. A uh, $30 million campaign to uh, that will help us end family homelessness in the city by December of 2021. We also have seen the Tipping Point Initiative, $100 million to help reduce chronic homelessness by 50%. Many tech companies have been involved in that, and two of our navigation centers have been funded through uh, donations from, from tech companies and large investments from, from Google to not only support the Nav Center, but also to help uh, stand up our, our new data system. So we've been very blessed to have uh, the corporate community really step up in San Francisco and help add resources. You know, going back to the encampments, the, the encampments now cover sidewalks. In some cases, they stretch out into the actual road. It, it just feels like it's an accident waiting to happen. And then when you hear business owners, they will say, look, I'm trying to run a business here, and people are having to step around all of this. They have to step over syringe needles. Uh, do you get a lot of calls from business people complaining? And when you do get a call, what do you tell them? Uh, we tell them we'll respond. Uh, we recognize this is no way for people to live outdoors. And um, if a situation is one that's interfering with the local community and we know that there are health issues and there are safety issues, uh, we send outreach teams out there to help somebody find a path to get to the shelter uh, and to get services, and we move them. 
If I'm a business owner and I make a call to City Hall, where does my call go to? Who answers that call, Mayor Schaaf? Uh, it depends what number you call. <laughs> <laughs> what number should I call if I'm a business um, owner? Actually, by the new year, uh, Oakland will finally have a 311 system. It is one of my promises as mayor, uh, but that will not be up until uh, January. For right now, you can call the mayor's office at 238-3161, or you can call our call center, and that's 615-5566. But um, we do, we will shut down uh, encampments that have gotten to a safety crisis. We have gotten several claims um, under the ADA uh, from disabled citizens who have had to go out into the streets and have nearly gotten hit by cars because the sidewalks are completely obstructed. And there's and health concerns for your crews, city crews that have to go clean up because there's a hepatitis concern. People are at risk when they have to go in. You did your story, you talked to some of the homeless men living under the overpasses in Oakland and they go to the bathroom in buckets. Those buckets get dumped. They go in the storm drains. So it poses a health risk potentially for all of us. Yes, and we have provided a lot of special equipment for those crews to address those um, crises and we are also uh, being on top of their there let me just be clear that there have not been hepatitis cases found in homeless encampments in the Bay Area at this time there is an outbreak in San Diego and we are all yeah. right on top of that to mm -hmm. prevent that Jeff let me ask you so you have 7500 homeless people estimated in, in San Francisco what specifically are the things that the city is doing right now to deal with those homeless people well the most important thing we're doing is adding another 1,300 units of permanent supportive housing over the next five years and also adding a whole variety of rent subsidies and other programs ranging from you know one or two months of rent assistance or helping people reconnect to family members and other communities up to and including permanent supportive housing. Where? Really Where do you put that? San Francisco is so crowded, their housing is hard to come by. Where do you find room for these? Well, San Francisco currently has 7,500 units of permanent supportive housing already. We have more per capita than any other city in the United States. And uh, we've done this over the past uh, 20 years, and we will continue to find sites. Some of them are owned by the um, city. Some of them are former redevelopment sites. Some of them are private-owned sites. But look, as the mayor said, this is just very hard work. There's no yeah. easy solution mm -hmm. to this. We find the sites, we work with neighbors, we gather up the financing, and, and we make it happen. Just because it's hard doesn't mean you know we're not going to keep doing it. And are you seeing a changing face of the homeless? We've talked about how people who there will always be chronically homeless, people who don't want to work, people who have drug addiction problems, mental health problems. But now we're seeing families. We're seeing people who may have suffered a downturn, a, an illness that sent them out onto the street. So you can't put all homeless people in one bucket. That's right. We tend to think of the problem um, as youth and families with children and adults. And fortunately, in San Francisco, we've started to see a uh, um, decrease in family homelessness since 2013. There was a large spike after the recession, and we finally have started to bend the curve. I think we saw a 17 percent reduction, and uh, we are working towards ending that What do you in think San changed Francisco. that? Well, part of that is the investments that were made both by Mayor Lee and through this Heading Home campaign and adding more units of permanent housing for families, as well as adding rent subsidies, uh, opening up more units in our housing authority to make them available for homeless families really a combination of resources. Mayor, does it ever feel overwhelming? Because there is no one good easy solution. There are a number of very difficult solutions and even then we're not sure if that's going to fix the entire problem. Does it, as a mayor, get overwhelming? Well, we are in a crisis, and you're right, there is no one solution. We have to try a variety of things, and as we discuss, Housing First is, is the best solution to ending homelessness, but it takes time for cities to develop that inventory of housing. And so what do we do in the interim? And one of the things that Berkeley is doing is similar to some of the ideas that have been discussed by the mayors uh, this evening. We're actually going to be uh, implementing a, a navigation center, a pop-up navigation center, um, and a tiny home community on one site in West Berkeley. And that facility is designed to get people out of encampments into a much more stable living environment where we can provide services and get them connected to housing and bridge that gap that we're seeing and to have an encampment resolution team similar to what San Francisco has to have people go out and engage with encampment residents mm -hmm. and then to get them connected to short-term and long-term housing. That's, that's been a strategy that's worked in, in San Francisco. It's worked in other communities. 
so we're fortunate that in San, Fran in San Francisco and in Oakland and in San Jose and throughout California, there's a lot of innovative solutions that have been developed, and we just need to take those best practices and apply them to address our speci Mayor, specific challenges. Is there challenges. a fine line between uh, being compassionate, everyone wants to be compassionate, but if you offer too many services, would the thought be that that would attract homeless to come to your city? Yeah, I know that's been a widespread concern, but our data is similar to what uh, Libby described. Uh, we're finding that more than 80% of the folks who are living in encampments were last housed in San Jose. Uh, they were simply struggling while they were housed, and they're ours. And so, uh, one way or another, we've got to address it square on. And, and so, we are seeing that there are populations where we're able to reduce homelessness. As we've seen in our census, we're reducing veterans' homelessness. We've got more than 700 homeless vets housed in the last year and a half, focusing on how we can partner with landlords, for example, to better utilize existing housing stock, whether it's a secondary unit or a spare bedroom, and providing incentives for them to help bring their apartments up to code in exchange for their willingness to take uh, a vet with a federal voucher to enable them to get housed. You know, there are lots of solutions that, we're, that are working in specific subpopulations. Uh, we need to get them all deployed because we need an all the above strategy. We're getting close to running out of time. We could keep talking about this, obviously, mm -hmm. for a long time because, as we've all said, it's a very complex issue. We want to go around and kind of just get a final thought from all of you as we end our discussion, which has gone over quite a bit. So let's see. I'm going to volunteer someone. Who should we start with our final? Let's start with you, Jeff. You start with your final thought. About 30 uh, seconds sure. if you, you know, can. My final thought is that this seems overwhelming to, to many of us who work in city government, but imagine how overwhelming it is to people who are living on the streets and just ask everybody to remember that people on the streets they didn't they don't want to be there when they were young they didn't want to grow up and be homeless these are you know not problems to be solved these are individuals these are our brothers and sisters and our neighbors so i ask everybody who is watching this tonight just to remember that when you walk by somebody on the street who uh, seems like they're homeless or need somebody to talk to say hello give them a smile uh, and, and just take a moment to recognize them as, as uh, a fellow uh, member of our Bay Area community. I'm so glad you said that because it's so easy and, and, and I'm sure we've all done it. You can drive right past them, walk right past them, and they're invisible. You don't think about you don't think about that they're human beings just like we are, uh, that just for whatever reason they're down on their luck. Mayor, let's go with, to you now. I think that's, that's a good point to end on, which is many of the people that we're seeing in our streets are people that were previously housed. They are victims of the the regional statewide housing crisis and so we do need to create more housing that's affordable for people all income levels but we need to do more to to create that permanent supportive housing as well as do, uh, implement strategies like navigation centers that can get people off the streets it's a very complex challenge it, it's a national crisis but we're fortunate in the bay area that we have leaders that are willing to step up to the to the plate to address this this challenge all right mayor Cardle, let's go to you this is going to be the moral barometer for our generation. And so if we don't take some risks and be very focused in, in addressing uh, how we tackle the challenge of homelessness, uh, history isn't going to forgive us. Uh, we know the problems only get worse with neglect. Mayor Schaff? Well, I just want to appreciate everyone who's at this table because I can feel that each one of us is committed to fixing the problem, not just moving the problem to someone mm -hmm. else's area. Um, I think it's important that we clarify, at least for Oakland, that encampments are not healthy for anyone. They're not healthy for the unsheltered residents. They're not healthy for the community around them. And yet in Oakland, we are moving at the speed of compassion and capacity. And so we will be asking for our residents' patience as we take on this complex problem um, based on our ability, but also as, as humans. Um, I do want to make one request out to the viewing public. Um, for people who do come and bring food to the homeless, please do not leave food uh, that is not asked for. Um, please do not dump belongings that are not asked for. We really are having a hygiene and health problem. Um, and if you are distributing food, consider picking up a bag of trash while you are there as well. And then finally, consider inviting someone who has been through the Henry Robinson House, who has been through a rehabilitative process, um, to come and be a roommate. We have 250 
homeowners in the city that have taken in uh, people who've come out of the Henry Robinson house and have had a very positive experience. So if you have any interest in this, please send us an email to rooms in Oakland. That's rooms in Oakland at bayareacs.org. Uh, again, rooms in Oakland at bayareacs.org. Also, if you're a landlord and you want to just rent one unit to uh, a veteran, um, again, you have guaranteed rent on time. There is much assistance and support. Please welcome these people into your home. Everyone needs a hand up at a point in their lives. And we will put all that information on our website Thank so people you. miss part of that. They can go to ktvu.com and find that. I think that's a great way to end, and, and I really appreciate all four of you coming here. Uh, you can feel the compassion that all of you have, and it's an issue that uh, there's a lot of work ahead, and as you said, Mayor, a lot of very hard work with some difficult choices ahead. But we have no choice. Uh, it starts with a conversation, a dialogue, and getting everyone together and brainstorming yeah. can make a difference. So thank you for being thank with us all. on your Sunday nights. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Well, thank you again at home for joining us. Our special Homeless in the Bay Area Searching for a Solution will continue right after the break. Well, as we heard a few minutes ago, affordable housing is a major issue. Laws protecting renters is also a main factor for keeping people in their homes and not on the streets. KTVU's Candace Wynn spoke with an attorney who says the laws were written years ago. The Bay Area's housing problem has grown. At a speed many people and laws couldn't have prepared for, according to attorney James Cook. Both landlords and tenants would say that the current housing law has contributed to at least the rental crisis. For instance, the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act, which governs rent control ordinances. Cook believes some current rent control laws actually prevent landlords from keeping up with rising maintenance costs over time. And he says just cause eviction laws make landlords afraid to rent to low income tenants because the eviction legal process is so difficult. On the other hand, some tenants don't feel laws protect them enough. These are all written two decades ago, Costa Hawkins before that. So they're written before we experienced the intensity of this crisis. No one predicted that there was going to be such, uh, there's going to be such inten intense activity with respect to evictions and, and landlords and tenants fighting each other. Cook says big developers are more equipped to survive and thrive under current laws. But for small owners, you're risking homelessness if someone does not pay you rent. We've got to update the laws. We've got to rewrite them with, with lawyers, of course, with lawmakers. But also, a good idea would be to bring in social workers and also economists. You think the Bay Area can do that? You've got activists on both sides. And if the politicians only listen to the activists, then we may never do it. And the short answer is yeah. I mean, if, if there's some will and desire. Candace Wen, KTVU, Fox 2 News. Well, more than a year ago, our partners at The Chronicle put together the San Francisco Homeless Project. More than 70 media organizations came together dedicated to covering the causes and solutions to homelessness in the Bay Area. And joining us now is the editor-in-chief of The Chronicle, Audrey Cooper. Uh, you listened to the interviews there with the mayors mm -hmm. and with the director of housing in San Francisco. What were your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's... I don't envy the job they have. They've inherited a huge problem that, like Jeff said, has been going on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, I think as a community, what is so important for us and for, for KTBU doing this, this segment is that this is a very complicated problem. There is a housing problem for sure, but there's also a street behavior problem. And sometimes we mix all of those up. And what, I what do you mean by street well, behavior I mean, problem? Uh, when, when, I, when I drive to work and I see somebody shooting up heroin in my parking lot or when I have my kid's birthday problem and there are needles or you see human waste on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. those are not necessarily problems with homelessness. It's a street behavior problem. And I think um, as a community, that's what we see most often. The, the vast majority of our homeless residents are housed in 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 not not living on the streets they're they're couch surfing they're in marginally housed areas they're not on the streets 
So th this problem is so much more complex than just do you have a house or not. It's really street behavior that is affecting people who are not homeless. Did you hear something tonight from one of our guests that gave you reason to be optimistic that something would be done to help this crisis? Oh, for sure. I, I, I think they're all, you know, the fact that they're all at this table is, <laughs> first yeah. of all, a huge, a huge step. The fact that we are now in San Francisco particularly starting to keep a database of people so they don't have to tell their stories and what they've been through so that you can have an organized system. I mean, government, as you know, it's complex. The, the bureaucracies get to be giant and unwieldy things. And when you're trying to help a very difficult population, you know, streamlining that is a huge first step. You said you moved to the Bay Area in the late 90s, mm -hmm. and we're all seeing an increase in these encampments. They just seem like they're in sprawling and they're taking up entire city blocks, like the homeless are uniting, coming together. We were talking in the break. You said you have a good explanation or a thought as to why they might be coming together. Well, I, you know, I, I think uh, the sheer number of people is greater than it used to be. Uh, there are fewer resources for people. And, and look, if, if you don't have a place to live, these encampments can be very attractive places. Uh, they, have, they have their own leaders. They have their own rules. They have a semblance of... Um, community there. Mm -hmm. They have protection from things. I mean, they can be very they attractive watch each places. Backs. Yeah. yeah, they they do. So they're also very dangerous places for those people. Um, you, if you meet a woman who lives on the streets, there is almost no chance she hasn't been raped. Uh, there is almost no chance that people who live there aren't exposed to drugs and violence on a regular basis. These are not stable places to live. Through your research and your team in covering these stories, what do you think is the answer to those that street behavior, those growing encampments? Well, certainly housing is part of it. Um, but then there's also, you know, you need to get services to those people. The opioid epidemic, it's not just in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. It is nationwide. It's even worldwide. Um, it is a hard thing to fix. There needs to be a lot more resources dedicated to that. There needs to be places where people can use the bathroom. Um, you don't stop having to use the bathroom when you're homeless. <laughs> Audrey, we have to go in just a second here, but just kind of a yes or no answer. Can this be fixed? Um, well, I hope so, and I don't think it's good enough to for us to throw up our hands and say no. Uh, we have we have to try a heck of a lot harder. All right, Audrey Cooper, appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Audrey. And thank you so much for joining us. We've gone over some important ideas for solutions, and you can see just how difficult an issue this is. And for links to nonprofits and other ideas on how you can get involved, head to our special homeless section on KTV.com. We have links and phone numbers for you there. Plus, if you missed part one of our special, you can watch. Watch it right there online, and by the end of the night, we'll have this episode on our site as well for you to share or watch again. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. The 10 o'clock news is coming up next. Good night.